Welcome to our conversation. My name is uh, Dr. Kristen Rodier. I am a um, professor of philosophy at Athabasca University. Uh, my name is Dr. Emily R. Douglas. I'm an individualized tutor at Athabasca University, and I'm also an instructor at Benny College. And joining us today is Liddell McWhorter. Uh, Dr. Liddell McWhorter is a recently retired chair emerita in women's gender and sexuality studies and a professor emerita of environmental studies at the University of Richmond, Virginia in the USA. She's the author of two very influential monographs, Bodies and Pleasures, Foucault and the Politics of Sexual Normalization, and Racism and Sexual Oppression in Anglo-America, a Genealogy. She's currently finishing a new manuscript titled Unbecoming Persons on Ethical Responsibility in the Face of Globalization and Climate Change. Welcome, Liddell, and thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, thank you. I'm just delighted to be here. <laughs> we're planning on discussing your book, Racism and Sexual Oppression in Anglo-America, a Genealogy, as Kristen has shown. Um, and so we want to gear this discussion to those who are somewhat familiar with that work, but we think it will be of value for many others as well. Before we dive into that book specifically, could you give us a little bit of background on your entry into philosophy, like how you came to philosophy and what kinds of problems were motivating for you? Wow, um, that could go way back. I think I knew that I was going to be a philosophy major before I got to college, even though I had no real idea what it was. But um, I had heard a talk when I was, I think, probably 15 or 16 in high school by a mathematician, but he was talking about Zeno's paradox. And I loved it because I didn't really like my math teachers. And um, it seemed to me that what he was telling me was that they had something really basically wrong. Um, and that philosophy might be where you could figure that out. So that's that was one of the ways in which I was intrigued by it. So I started taking philosophy classes as soon as I got to college and continued, I, although I declared a political science major because that seemed more likely to get me into questions of justice and things like that that I was very interested in. It turned out that they didn't, political scientists didn't really care about that. And it was really the philosophers who did. So I stuck with philosophy, fell into graduate school because uh, I graduated from college in 1982. The economy was terrible, uh, the worst it had been until 19, I mean, sorry, 2008, which century do I live in? Um, and graduate school was as lucrative as any job I could get, believe that or not. So uh, I went to graduate school in philosophy and the job market opened up in an odd way at about the end of that, in the mid to late 80s. And I, I ended up with a job. Um, so it was all accident not planned a little follow-up we're wondering um how you, did you become interested in using Foucault to think about problems of oppression like at what point in your trajectory did you um stumble across this well that's an easy one to remember I I took a class first year graduate school I'd never heard of Michel Foucault before and uh, I took a class in which he was mentioned, I think, and maybe an article was read. I don't know. At any rate, on during the Thanksgiving break in the U.S., that would be in November, um, I had a little time and I picked up a, a, a book, that Language Countermemory Practice. There wasn't very much Foucault published yet in English in those days, but I got that from somewhere and I read some essays in that. And, and then over winter break, uh, about six weeks later, I read History of Sexuality, Volume 1. So it was at that point that I thought this is the this makes more sense than anything else I've ever read. But I was 23, so how much had I read? At any rate, it seemed like it was just so promising. And, and so from that point on, I was really interested in what trying to figure out how I could use Foucault for the things that I thought really Foucault was talking about in the background, sometimes just lurking. You know, he always said that his uh, his 
his biographies were in his book. I think I could see that, oddly enough, a little bit like mine, and a way of seeing the world, a perspective that I had. But so that's where I started. And I was lucky enough to be in a place that had um, a couple of people who were, who were indulgent enough to let me do work in Foucault and in feminist theory, even though we didn't have any uh, feminist scholars in the Vanderbilt department at that time. But uh, so they indulged me and um, I was idiosyncratic and not very demanding. So kind of let me go my way. You, you start off the book with this story and um, it's just really impactful as the reader. It gives us a good sort of background to what you're thinking behind the book. Like I always feel with a book um, or, or a longer piece, there's always some kind of animating experience. Maybe that speaks to my intellectual background, but it's so rare that we really get that from the author. Hey, here's here's where I was. I had this moment, why was I hesitating? What was so, um, what was going on there? How can I unpack this, you know, using the tools of philosophy? Um, you're at a memorial where someone asks, does anyone know the words to we shall overcome? And it was a memorial for Matt Shepard. Yes. And so then you get to this question of, should I sing? a civil rights anthem at this memorial that is about someone who was um, targeted for their sexuality. And so can we sort of, it's a question of analogy really. And so this story really sticks with me. I know you talk about the rain when you're driving and I sort of feel it when I'm reading it and you know, come back to that in the book. Um, it is now almost 25 years since that moment that then sparked this reflection and this rich, rich book that many of us have engaged with in our scholarship. Would you be willing to revisit that story a little bit? Yeah, it's hard to believe in a way that it's been so long. And one of the things that means is that probably most of the people, most of your students and most of the people who would see this interview won't remember that event, even though it was national news for days and days and days at the time in the United States, and I'm sure in Canada as well. Yeah. Matt Shepard lingered for five or six days in a coma on life support, and we got daily updates. Mm -hmm. And then when he finally died, he was his parents decided to take him off life support. Then this vigil was was um, arranged very hastily, as was the case, I think, around the country with most such events. And the the people who put it together were just a bunch of undergraduates who probably had never tried to organize anything like that before. And this was in the days when email was was young. You know, this was not uh, not a not an easy thing to put together with people not very well networked across a very large campus. I happened to be there because I was on sabbatical and I was finishing uh, the index for Bodies and Pleasures. And I didn't know what my next project would be. I felt very blank in a in a good way blank and empty bodies and pleasures was everything I thought I ever had to say <laughs> and uh, and I just didn't know what was next I I thought that I needed to do something that had to do with with race and racism you may recall since I know you've read bodies and pleasures that there's a part near the end about learning to dance yes. and about uh, and it's, a, and it's about line dancing, it's country dancing. And I started going to a bar um, and it, it was clear that if you really wanted to do the dance as well, you had to have very slick leather shoes and most people wore cowboy boots. So I got these cowboy boots and the, you know, I'm, I'm talk about that, about feeling really strange because those boots at that time represented to me a lot of things were re really connected with racism. And it was uncomfortable to me to to have them on and to appear in public with them on. And so that was happening. And I was I was realizing that I had left that hanging in bodies and pleasures. And that was all I could see that I hadn't really worked through that needed to be worked through in that book. So I was reading Martin Luther King. I was reading everything Martin Luther King had had written that I could find. Mm -hmm while I was doing the index for bodies and pleasures. And that 
that I was just stunned that I think every person there was white and they were very young. I mean, it, these were, you know, 18, 19 and um, new in the world. <laughs> Not that I was all that old in the world yet, but um, they were just overwhelmed with this. And I realized that violence, this kind of deep hatred, violence, and just taking advantage of people in some sense, just for the pleasure of being able to do it, that was not at all unfamiliar to me. I grew up in that world. It it was it was jarring in a way to start thinking deeply about how how much my life had been structured by violence. Racist violence is what I'm thinking of in particular. But I always knew growing up that racist violence could easily become violence against women, particularly if a white woman crossed the color line, could easily become violence against a queer person just cause, you know, and all of those things were so real, so present. So I was thinking how the threat of violence and the and to myself as well as to others around me, whatever their race, all seem like part of that structure of a racist society, a white supremacist society, as uh, in more general terms, I would say. So those things were in my mind at the time. And so on the one hand, when Matt Shepard was killed, it was horrible. And there were other horrible murders of queer people and of Black people that year. This was, in a certain way, not unusual in a horrible way. I guess it's not unusual still. The surprise of these young people, these young white queer people, at the fact that they themselves might have been Matt Shepard. And I, I thought this is so this is such an important realization for them. And they need they need so much right now. And I don't know how to give it to them. And I, I don't even know where I am in this, this way of thinking of all these things together. It was, it was a collision of various feelings and almost collision of worlds for me that night and coming back from, from the vigil. And, and so that was the story. I had no idea what it was going to turn into. And that's typical of me when I start a book. I didn't even really start that book then. It was a few months, maybe a year before I wrote the story down. Mm -hmm. But I knew it was the beginning of what I had to think through. It's so interesting because it sounds to me like there's a kind of a resemblance that you were aware of through that a, a violence that sort of mimics itself, reiterates itself and sort mm -hmm. of patterns. Um, and it's like that kind of gets into my next question, which is about how your work has um, really sort of focused on these operations of power and how they um, re reinforce and adapt and are flexible. And rather than sort of other political frameworks or other oppression frameworks of oppression, which really start from kind of bound identity categories right sort of mm. single axis bound categories and then we're we're struggling to get them back together yours really works from this kind of an analytic of sameness let's say in, in your terms i wanted to sort of ask you am, am i right about that that you're the way that you're approaching these questions of oppression is to the side of uh, identity politics, or 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 really making a choice not to take take that direction. Yeah, I think it's it wasn't so much a choice not to as it just I began the way you described that it 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 just doesn't lead quite there when you start the way I started and yeah what I was interested in was not conflating i mean i very much did not want to do that and that's one of the, part of the dilemma in the in the opening of the book not conflating but seeing possibilities for collaboration cooperation and dismantling i was i really was want i was fearful of the amount of racism that still existed much of it without 
awareness in queer movements. And, and there seemed to be kind of a, a, a radical right push to drive a wedge between anti-racist movements and anti-heteronormative movements and queer people generally. That was going on in a deliberate way in uh, um, the religious right, for example. The white religious right was deliberately and using monetary resources to do it, uh, deliberately trying to pull um, anti-racist movements and black people in particular away from queer people. And that had not been the case. There had been more connection um, before the 1990s. So I was worried about that and I was sad to see it happening. Uh, and I thought there's gotta be another way to think about this. I just don't know what it is. Yeah, and that's so cool about this book is it kind of gives a, a re resources for someone to think through the technique of that wedge between the two groups and to, I guess that's why I said sameness because actually still looking for affinities and how those operations work, um, which, you know, w without it being conflating. Yeah, and without it being cliched, uh, you know, uh, King said, and he's been often quoted saying this, and, and sometimes it does sound like a cliche, injustice, you know, anywhere is injustice everywhere. We can't, or something to that effect anyway, we can't, uh, we can't sit by and not think that an injustice or oppression affects us just because it's not directed at us, just because we're not the victim of it. And, and that seems, mm -hmm. that, that seems really important and true to me, but it, people, say it when they basically mean jump on my bandwagon. <laughs> they don't always uh, think it when it's, I need to jump on that issue. That's my issue too. Um, and I've gotten to understand more and more and more deeply as the years and decades have gone by how, how deeply racism is my issue. And I don't mean to say that because I'm white and therefore I'm guilty of it. Um, but I mean to say it because it structures my life, it structures our lives, particularly in the United States. And I think in Canada it does too, but in different, some different ways. Um, but I couldn't possibly be who I am and have the life I have if I had not grown up in a society that is tremendously white supremacist. Mm -hmm. For good or ill, I have been shaped by that and I need to understand it and I need to try to respond to it in, in you know, ways that are compassionate and caring and just. Um, so I guess the book changed me in that it, it gave me a certain amount of courage and some confidence to approach that without fear that I was going to make a mess and that I was going to mm -hmm. offend somebody. I, I, I got a ground sort of that I could stand on when I talked about these issues. And so now in retrospect, I hope that, as you said, that it gives others some kind of a ground or resources to be able to work themselves through those sorts of issues, whatever their racial or ethnic or other background. Yeah, one of the things that we found so compelling um, about this particular book um, is actually the central role of disability or capacity or abilities, right, in racism against the abnormal. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, for me, a really strong thread, right, that kind of starts to make sense of how this this wedge, right, is, is driven um, over time. Um, and Kristen and I have also talked about how it, it sort of prompts the readers uh, methodologically to look for the ways in which power adapts and changes to new situations, right, rather than being a kind of static forces. Mm -hmm. For example, um, in this book, when you talk about the shift from kind of classical eugenics to family values, right, um, those chapters were really, really striking um, and impactful for me because I think those are some connections that um, we often don't make. Um, 
So we were wondering um, when you were writing it, did you think that disability would be so central? Um, and has what came out of it um, had any sort of downstream effects um, in your writing since you did this one? Well, I think it's a, a major thread in the book too, but no, I didn't have any awareness that that was happening while I was writing the book. I didn't really know anything about disability studies then. I certainly didn't think of myself as doing work in that area, but after the book was published, very shortly after the book was published, people who did work in disability studies started telling me what I had been doing in that book, and I realized they were right. Um, this is one of those things that people tell you about books that you don't, the author is not always the one who's the best interpreter, and in this case, that's definitely true, uh, at least not while I was the author. Now I'm another reader like you, but um yeah, I think it's really important, and I think it actually centers what we would now call disability and disability studies in a way I never imagined I was doing. And it it really um, makes both race and uh, heteronormativity kind of functions of ability and disability. Yes. Um, which surprised me. And since, of course, people started telling me that's what I was doing, I began to do reading in disability studies and did a little bit of teaching uh, of, of disability studies works, particularly in queer theories, where it, it works really well. In my queer theories course, Eli Clare, mm -hmm. um, Allison Kafer, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, Kim Hall, those, those are great people to teach in courses like that and students are just blown away by it, brings together so much. And if the book is, is plausible, one of the reasons it brings together so much is it has been so central through the 20th century and into the 21st century in the way that oppressions in general, more generally, have been structured and motivated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I follow up on that? Um, the thing that I really grabbed from this book and and shaped I, well Emily and I really shaped into something with this book is really thinking about normal being normal yeah. having a normal body having a normal sexuality it really kind of became this that 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 concept that we're looking at all the sides of and all the operations of and I think normal is very weird um I think we want to be normal but it's bad yeah. to be normal. I want to be different. Yeah. But also, you know, I remember my first encounters with Foucault, you know, 15 years ago or whatever. Um, learning, okay, normalization. That's what normalization is. Understanding techniques, hierarchical observation, all of these ways that, um, you know, normalizing judgment, all of these operations of power. And to me, I'm seeing them as, you know, primarily negative, let's say. Um, but now in popular discourse, you you want to normalize things, normalize yes. breastfeeding, mm -hmm. normalize mm -hmm. this. Do you think about that, about the uses of normal now or? Yeah, yeah. And that one in, that you say in particular, where it means to, to render acceptable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We normalize international relations, diplomatic relations, you know, when we have a rapprochement with some uh, country we were at odds with. So I suppose that use of the term may be actually older than Foucault's particular use of it, but it still sounds weird. Um, you know, for, Foucault wasn't especially wedded to the terms he chose either, so we can just probably come up with some other way to talk. But then there are lots of good critiques of the normal. There's, you know, Michael Warner's book and um, and a number of other things are really, really important, I think, um, that take to task the notion that there's something about normal. And really, as Foucault shows, normal, it, it, one of the threads of normal's ancestry is is uh, statistical uh, data keeping and interpretation. And so it, it, you know, it's kind of surprising to some people to say, well, you know, there were no normal people 300 years ago. There was no such thing as a normal person uh, or an abnormal one for that matter. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's that. It, it shakes people up in a fun way when you say things like that. But I still feel even when we talk about in the positive way, like you're saying, to breastfeed is normalized or something. I still think, though, that it would be better if we said it in a different way, you know, mm -hmm. to make it acceptable, to make it uh, socially uh, commonplace or something like that. So, yeah, I don't use it in that way. I try to avoid it. But that's idiosyncratic. <laughs> but I'm thinking about work that is sort of doing similar things. Um, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with Sabrina Strings' uh, book, which is um, Fearing the uh, Fat Black Body, or Fearing the Black Body, and then it says uh, anti-fatness as anti-blackness as a subtitle or something. And um, mm -hmm. it, it again looks at this kind of, in your use of Foucault, a kind of racism against the abnormal, as a way of sort of morphologically identifying fat on the body as a degenerative trait, and then talking about it in different intellectual domains, such as art and philosophy, and looking at it eugenically and thinking about the transatlantic slave trade. So I think it, it, the book is really fascinating and it does this archival work as well. Um, and there's just something so useful i think about going to an archive and really with these with these um with the genealogical method i think is what i'm trying to say yeah i i really like work like that too whether it is is similar to or reinforcing of mine or not just <laughs> it just opens up a lot of a lot of new things to think about and i'm always happy about that um but yeah i just saw the title and i just heard about it a little bit few days ago and thought oh, I got to get that one um <laughs> that's that sounds like something that would be really good for me to read I guess I'm going to just think think about the kind of book and the end of your book and the beginning of the book as they work together um where you kind of bring up this story this hesitation go through this archive and come out with um um tools for thinking about the resonances, let's say, between anti-queer violence and racist violence and how those techniques work together. Um, and then you revisit the story at the end of the book. <laughs> so we're not yeah. sort of, I think the reader becomes really curious about how you are coming to that at the end of your book. Not just that story, but in terms of, you know, going through the journey of your book, what would you hope that readers are taking away? Well, I, I said at the point that I wrote the book, it was I was hoping that readers would see that our fights and the work that we're trying to do across these different movements really have a lot in common. There are lots of points at which we can connect and collaborate. And we're working toward very similar things, but from different angles. So, well, you know, I always like a good story and you always have to have some sort of end point. You can't just yeah. tell a story and let it hang. So there's got to be that. I also think that that philosophy in particular doesn't personalize as much as it could and should, that, that there's a lot of power in saying how something real happened and how it happened. And I mean, by something real, I mean something very concrete, like this story yeah. and how it happened and and how all of the things that that opened up and all of the things that caused me to regret. I didn't, i never was satisfied with the decision I made in that moment. Um, but I don't know that I should have done anything differently at the same time. And I guess that's often where we are in our political and, and work and in our ethical lives. We just, things happen. We're driven to think deeply about them, hope that, we can make things not happen in the same way, perhaps, and not be able to change anything that already happened or that, or even second guess it. So mm -hmm. I guess that's how the book ends, sort of inconclusively in a way with regard to that particular dilemma. Yeah, I guess when we were thinking about um, the sort of archival work, which we, we've just spoken a bit about, kind of um, your fondness for it, right? And the kind of um, concrete particular that it offers um 
if you had a student reading this book um, who's like, yes, I love genealogy. I want to go to an archive and start developing my own. Um, what would be your advice? The first thing is, if you want to do this, it's important to pick something that really bothers you. <laughs> find it, It's got to be something that you find intolerable or deeply, deeply confusing and disturbing. You, I think you really have to start in a in a fairly intense emotional place. That may not be, you know, that you're ready to scream and kill people, and maybe that wouldn't be the best place to start. But um, something, it, it, part of the reason why you have to do that is because that will give you the energy to push through the project. But that's really secondary. The main reason is because when you feel that way about something what's happening is real. It's not just in you. There's a tension in the world. And that tension in the world, that place that you're so confused that you feel blocked about how to respond, you don't know what to do. It's making you angry that things aren't different, whatever that might be. That is real in the world. And there are things to find out about how it got to be that way and what forces are making it that way and keeping it that way and want it to be that way and so I think to begin with your own feelings hmm. to choose the topic on the basis of your own feelings is is the right way to start that doesn't mean that the topic you choose is the topic that turns out to be what you pursue because sometimes you think that the issue is one thing and it's really when you start examining it examining it slightly different and so you veer in a slightly other direction and that on the current book project that happened to me in the beginning I thought I was going to be writing about about freedom and that it, that turned out not to be what I was writing about and I, I realized that within a, a few months the other thing that that a student needs to know is that genealogy is not a fast project <laughs> And so it's probably not the best thing to pick for your term paper that is due in six weeks while you're taking other courses. But it is a good thing to do if you have like a summer research grant yeah. or a master's thesis or, or, or you can even do this as a hobby. Um, it is possible. Uh, so, and it, and it can be personally beneficial, even if it goes no place beyond that, getting you a credential or something. So it takes some time and you need to be sure you have some time or you just get frustrated or you do a poor job. Once you get in there and just start figuring out what seems to be related to what's bothering you, and there's probably going to be components of it because you're probably looking at some kind of tension that involves more than one thing coming together. Um, so you're probably going to have more than one and then just start and any, and there will be rabbit holes. And that's what you, you need to not be afraid of that. Go down them. Now, sometimes you get a little too deep and you realize that's taking you away from the main project that may open up something for another project, but uh, yeah, you, you just, you follow out the, the, threads that began to become evident as as you find things and I spent I don't think I would have found a lot of the things that I did find if I hadn't uh, just wandered around the stacks of the library because I wouldn't have recognized what things were from titles in a in a, in a database or something like that and because I'm because I'm in Virginia and the library I was using for the most part was one that had been there for a hundred and some years. Um, lots of the eugenics material had been donated by various eugenics yeah. societies. And it was just there and with interesting little drawings and all kinds of things. You know, you just find stuff, you know, and then you can get very interested in things that are not terribly relevant. I, I got so interested in yellow fever epidemics while I was writing this book. And of course, it doesn't have anything to do with yellow fever epidemics. But um, yeah, so you end up going places you didn't mean to go. But so that's what I would say. Pick something that really matters to you, that really bothers you, that you don't know the answer to. And 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 give yourself time. And then follow your nose, I guess. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, if something really bothers you, the chances are good. It bothers other people, mm -hmm. but it, that may be the quiet part. We're not supposed to say out loud, but it's still it. Yeah. We, I said before, it's real. It's really there in the world. If, if it bothers you, it's going to bother somebody else. There's, there's other people who are worried about that, who don't know what to do about that too. Yeah. And I think we, it, yeah, we're almost in a way in academia generally, is not just in philosophy. We've been taught to be dishonest about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's so freeing not to do that anymore. When I wrote Bodies and Pleasures, you know, that begins with, with a sort of a story too. And and then there's a good bit about my own experiences in the book. And um the press I sent it to liked it. The editor liked it, but said, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to market this book. And one of the reviewers who now is a friend of mine and, and knew who I knew at the time talked to me about it. In fact, um, at the time said, y you know, aren't you worried about what this is going to do to your professional reputation? And I just couldn't write it any other way and be in any way honest about why I cared about any of these issues and what they really meant. Part of the argument of that book, too, was that Foucault's work can be very um, radically politically motivating. But at the time, there were all these criticisms that Foucault's work made us all complacent mm -hmm. and conservative. And, um, and I was reacting against that. Um, so I needed to say it hasn't had that effect on me. And I don't think it has had that effect on everybody. So that was part of the argument. It still seems to me whether it's part of the argument or not. It's part of it's part of why the argument matters. It's why, why it's important. And you know, philosophy is pulled back from anything that's socially or politically important since the Cold War, and that's why philosophy is really struggling as a discipline to remain mm -hmm. relevant in the academy or anywhere else. That needs to stop brought up your next project that started out to be about freedom and now has changed into something else. How much of a preview are you willing to talk us through about that? Oh, uh, well, as probably as much as you can stand. Um, <laughs> the reason I thought right. it was, I did a lot of reading about neoliberalism and mm. at the, after I did the, the racism book and um, and a lot of history of economics, which I knew nothing about before that. And that was e even more intensified during the 2008, 2009 recession. And all of that just, you know, I needed to understand the world better than I did. So, um, so I was reading, obviously, Foucault's work on neoliberalism and its relation to biopolitics and so on. There's a place where he talks about in the lectures he talks about how um, neoliberal governmentality produces liberty in order to consume it. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, that I got it. I got to deal with that sentence. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, so, so suggestive. And so I thought I was going to do that. So I was liberty or freedom. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of reading on population and a lot of, of reading in, as I said, the history of economics and so on. But what what really was the dilemma for me that was generating a lot of my energy um, in, in relation to this project was, I don't know how to be a, a decent human being, a good person in this world. I don't, even though I seem to have all the freedom of choice that, you know, I could possibly use, I'm overwhelmed with choices all the time. I don't feel like I'm really free to enact my values in a, a lot of cases. I, it's it's lesser of evils so often politically lesser of evils. As a consumer, it's so often lesser of evils. It's just so much of that, mm -hmm. and I started thinking a lot about that. And in fact, about the phrase, I can't. I how can I be a good person? And so I focused on the notion of person. Um, like okay, what? Why are we? Why are we talking about it in terms of personhood? One of the reasons was that I realized a lot of what needs to happen in order for us to survive as a 
set of societies or species, species or whatever in the next 50 years is that we're going to have some, we need to have some collective responsibility for globalization, climate change, so on, as you said in the introduction. And we can't get that if we are always thinking about how can I be a good person? That's not going to be a very firm basis for building any sort of collective response to big issues. Mm-hmm. So I, I, and I remembered some things from the racism book that I had read about the English Civil War and these odd phrases in some of the 17th century pamphlets that I was reading and some of the um, the transcript of the Putney debates and things like that. There's all this use of the term person that's foreign, clearly didn't mean what it means now. And so I thought, well, okay, so there's a before time. If there's a before time and an after time, there's a there's a turning point in there somewhere. Somehow this notion of modern moral personhood, which is what I began to call it, that I try to, I have been trying to instantiate in my life to be responsible, to be respectable, to be, to be, uh, to do the right thing. Somehow that has been created and somehow it's been created since the 17th century. Stepping back from the dilemma and looking at how we got here so that we have, we think about things in terms of my individual responsibility, my individual response to the world how did I get here? How did that become the focus of ethical life? Mm-hmm. And what? Uh, so what? So I kind of just read all kinds of stuff about personhood for months and months and months. Focused eventually on uh, John Locke. Never thought I'd be writing about John Locke. <laughs> the only good thing about John Locke is he wrote in English, sort of. Um, <laughs> which I read uh, fluently. So um, he's kind of the, he's a turning point. There's a, there's some backwards, there's some before time genealogical work that goes way back into the Roman nuances of Roman law and all kinds of weird stuff. Um, And then there's the after time where modern moral personhood gets filled out in this way that makes us, you know, almost atomistic individuals. And so the first four chapters of that book there's an introduction the first four chapters of that book are genealogy of personhood but specifically that a genealogy of modern moral personhood um and then the the last three chapters i've written the fifth chapter i've written part of the sixth chapter i have not written the seventh chapter so that's that's projected into the book uh the last three chapters i'm going beyond genealogy this is something i've never done in a book before to actually try to rethink um, ethical life outside of personhood as it's been conceived for 300 years and as I've experienced it yeah. and failed that. Um, so uh, it's creative and it's hard and that's why I'm kind of been stuck for a while on chapter six. Chapter five is on uh, ownership because mm-hmm. that's a key component, o- not only owning property, which is a key component, but also owning your actions, owning your feelings, owning whatever, owning your career. Um, so that was a fun chapter, right? The, the six chapters on individuality, mm-hmm. and it's been, been really hard and, and still hard. Uh, and the sixth chapter is, I mean, the seventh chapter is going to be on responsibility. But now that you're talking, Kristen, I, I realize I'm probably going to have to have an epilogue where I go back to the story that's in the introduction and talk about it again. <laughs> I've never presented an editor with a prospectus because I have no idea where I'm going when I start. Yeah. So I've always had to have a full manuscript before I could go to an editor. And that's true with this one too. I don't know where I'm going, right. even even though I'm halfway through chapter six. It's I'll just draw a connection to, you know, the work under discussion, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, the idea of individuals or individualism, um, as being sort of a higher evolution, right? Being individualized, mm-hmm. as being a higher self-sufficient sort of, um, you know, kind of genetic being, I guess, race betterment. Uh, yeah. um, but also there's something connected, I think, around moralizing the body and having a good body as yes. being part of being a good person. And so mm-hmm. we're managing our body to make it better 
for everyone. So I'm actually doing social good by <laughs> managing my body in a particular way. Like mm -hmm. it's kind of that internalized, now I'm part of that eugenic striving through my personhood. Yes, at, at the as I've gotten deeper into individuality as a liberal liberal esque concept, I guess, uh, yeah, um, maturation is key, and maturation mm -hmm. means increasing independence, physical yeah. independence, as well as you know mm -hmm. eventually intellectual independence and financial independence and political independence and all those things the story we tell of individual lives is very much like the eugenic story of the person who the, the race that grows up and takes care of itself and doesn't need guidance anymore and uh you know and isn't financially dependent and that sort of thing um yeah it's the same same kind of story and much of the time self-imposed um, I mean, we all think it. I'm now doing um, sort of backup daycare for a two-year-old, having <laughs> going through all those stages of uh, of growing independence and maturation, and feeling, you know, so proud of her when she gets something and uh, is able to do something by herself, and she's so proud. But and that and that there's not anything wrong with that. I mean, it's good, right? When we tell that story and stretch it out over the course of a life, it becomes a story about how we don't need each yeah. other or we shouldn't. Yeah. yeah. So I think bodies are front and center of it. Bodies with disabilities, bodies with um, older bodies, aging bodies, yeah. are, and very young bodies, although they're cuter, so they get away with more. But uh, those are those are burdens right and during covid this was people were saying well those old people okay so the old people will die but they were going to die anyway yeah mm -hmm. this is sort of a, a thought experimental see um if in this year 2023 you were going to go on a genealogical journey to answer a specific question or about a specific issue pretend you have a lot of time and a lot of money um, what what would you be pulled to look into next? Yeah, and there's so much in the world to to think about. I've become very very fascinated with biological sciences. Not that I know very much mm -hmm. about them, but I've been reading a lot, um, partly to try to understand individuality. Mm -hmm. I might do something in that direction, something that has to do with environmental. Mm -hmm. issues and yeah that's probably the kind of thing I'm going to spend a lot of time reading once this project is finished because you know you stack up books and you realize they're not directly related so that you yeah. have to put them off for a while but there they sit I've begun reading about concepts of individual existence in in biological science and how so much mm -hmm. of that has been breaking down as symbiosis has come to take center stage and uh, Lynn Margulis's work and others you're probably familiar with. And um, so I'm interested in that and where that will take me, I have no idea. The other thing that I have come to be very, very interested in um, since the publication of the racism book has been um, colonialism. I didn't know enough about, I, or I didn't know much at all about really about colonialism while I was doing that book. And I now think that that work, not necessarily that that book should have done this, but that that, that, that thinking needs to be placed into a more global context mm -hmm. of European colonization mm -hmm. of much of the rest of the world. And that's a lot of thinking I would like to do. And I've done a little bit, I've written just a little bit about that so those are the two areas, and they're probably related because almost everything yeah. is related to almost everything else. Yeah. Um, so if I have two books in me more, then maybe I do both, but maybe I'll just do one and it'll somehow involve both things. I'm very both impressed and baffled by people who do know what their next book is going to be about when they're still finishing one. <laughs> like, wow, you're smarter than me, but okay. <laughs> This book, um, at least for me, was very reor disorienting and then sort of 
um, it's like you go through the process of that genealogy as the reader um, kind of as intended. And, and, you know, for me, it set me in a direction of thinking about fatness and disability and how that's connected to race. Like there's ways to take these, these ways that you're pursuing how our concept came to be and spinning it off in other directions where it can also be kind of like rendered contingent. And, uh, you know, you were talking about the eugenics archive that you went through. You know, we did a lot of our um, graduate training at the University of Alberta, where the um, chair of the philosophy department for decades was the um, chair of the eugenics board of Alberta. And we had, um, uh, the the sterilization act until the 70s and yeah. um wow. so there's quite a legacy in um, Alberta and um so when we're reading at least I think for me in where I yeah. come, while there was a, an un, a, a real-time unearthing of this history in Alberta and building mm-hmm. of archives right there's there's archives at U of A now about um the eugenics there um it was just this sort of like resonance that was just really a, a really big shift i think yeah i was aware that there had been a big movement in alberta when i wrote the book i think i mentioned alberta once or twice but i didn't re- i didn't know it had to do directly with the university or the philosophy department and yeah. um yeah. yeah so and it was happening in virginia too i think it was 2003 that the governor of virginia apologized to mm the people who had been sterilized in the state. And that was in the, the very early stages of work that I was doing. So, yeah. And some of the material that was coming out, particularly about um, the the Buck v. Bell case oh, yeah. was was being written and released and journalists were writing things at that time. So I was, I was getting things also, as you say, in real time. This has been so helpful. And I know that... Um at least for me, when I'm reading an author's book, to be able to hear hear the voice, see the face, whatever the yeah. interaction is, and to hear a little bit about what goes on behind it, and to think about how your thinking has gone and has come from and gone in other directions. It's just so helpful. Thanks for discussing this book with us. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. And and I do want to encourage your students or anyone else that, that sees this to Really think about doing some of this work. You don't have to have a PhD in philosophy. You just have to be dogged <laughs> and, and and really pissed off about something. <laughs> I've got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> Most people do, I think, these days. Yeah, I think so. Okay.